chapter 7, verse 34. And it reads, I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groaning, and I have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. The next verse is Romans 11, chapter 20, verse, chapter 11, verse 29. And it reads, For the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. I want to talk to you this morning about unfinished business. As you read this text, you begin to realize that Acts chapter 7, verse 29 to 35 is a companion text to Exodus chapter 2 and 3. In this text, we recognize that this is the same Moses that the Hebrews rejected and he couldn't find it, and he couldn't find his way. The same Moses that didn't understand how to get his purpose accomplished and had to leave Egypt a total failure. And then God says to him, Moses, they're ready now. I've heard the groaning. What you couldn't do before, you can do now. What you failed at yesterday, you can accomplish now. Moses, we have unfinished business. Go back to Egypt. And part of the problem which exists back then in this text and still exists today is that we don't teach people about God. Our faith centers around us. And the reason your faith, and the reason your faith doesn't work is because your faith is built around you and how you feel and what's going on with, with you and what you need and what's going on in your life and what's going on with your emotions and, what you, and what's going on in your finances. In other words, your faith is built on circumstances and your circumstances rock like winds and waves to and fro. And so, and so you're diligent when you need God and you lack attention towards God when you don't because people have a tendency to use God like a butler to serve your needs. And so instead of teaching faith in God, we just teach faith. Never noticing that Jesus said, have faith in God. Moses and a lot of other individuals had no clue or idea who God is. Who is the Lord that we should believe in? That we should trust him? Is he just an idea, a euphoric conjure of our imagination? Is he an illusion conjured up by an eloquent preacher? Or is the I am, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the God who sits on the circle of the earth and has power in his hands, the God whose heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool, he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He which was and is and is to come. He is the Redeemer, the Day Star, the Builder, the Trumpet. He is so much that he cannot be defined. I am that I am. I can do whatever I want to do and be whatever I want to be. I am God all by myself. Nobody appointed me, nobody elected me, nobody can impeach me. I alone am God. And God said, I looked for somebody greater than myself, and I could find no one greater than myself. So I swear by myself that I alone am God, and besides me, there is no other. I am not a man that should lie, or the son of man that should repent. I have not have I not spoken it? Shall I not bring it to pass? All y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I am God. You're not trusting in your preacher. You're not trusting in your building. And you sure can't trust in yourself. You must trust in me. I am solid. I am stable. I am immutable. Irrevocable. Eternal. Everlasting. I am, I am, I am that I am. We bow before you, we humble ourselves and prostrate before you. We bring our wills under your will. We bow our heads and acknowledge that you alone are 
a mighty God. And when God decrees a thing, it is so. And when God wills it, it will come to pass. You don't have to vote. You don't have to, to get a protest. God is sovereign. God is absolute. And when God calls you, you will answer. When God says live, death can't take you. When God says die, all the hospitals cannot keep you alive. God. Yeah. And when I bless you, they'll never be able to curse you. If I curse you, they'll never be able to take it away. And if I curse you, your money and your education and everything you got will go down with you. Nobody can bless you if I curse you. And nobody can curse you if I bless you. I am God. That's why all the people need to holler. That's why all you people need to shout, I am God. And so, my brothers and sisters, my faith looks up to thee. O Lamb of Calvary, all that we have is centered and built around you. You alone are God, and without you, there is no other. And when God decrees a thing, it is so. I want to jump to Romans chapter 11, 29. God is speaking in the book of Romans chapter 11, verse 29, and God is telling the Romans who are not of the children of Israel that even though the traditional Orthodox Jews is not the friends of Christian ideology, God says don't get too much of an attitude because they are still my children. They may be a problem for you, but they're mine. And they're mine because I say they're mine. And so you've got to be careful how you handle them. And God says this in Romans chapter 11, verse 26. He says, And so all the Israelites shall be saved. And as it is written, there shall come out, out of Zion the deliverer, and, and he shall turn away the ungodliness of Jacob. God says, I'm going to fix them. For this is my covenant with them. This is my contract with them. And I shall take away their sins. God says, now concerning the gospel, there are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the sake, for the Father's sake, for gifts and callings of God are without repentance. In this text, God is saying, I'm going to deal with them, and the deliverer is going to come and reform them and, and salvage them. God says, I have unfinished business with them. He says, Gifts and callings are out repentance. God said that means if I call you, I won't change my mind. This is not about you. This is about me. And if I give my word, I'm going to do something. I will not take my word back. If I give you a gift, I won't take my gift back. And if I call you to do something, I won't take my calling back. For gifts and callings are without the repentance of God. But I want you to hear what the Message Bible says. The Message Bible says it real good. The Message Bible says gifts and callings are under full warranty, never canceled, and never rescinded. It's sovereign, unchangeable. He's absolute. He's God. Ask Noah. You can't get Noah to drink enough for God to rescind. When God has called you, God has called you. And when God has blessed you, God has blessed you. You don't have to worry about God changing his mind because God is immutable. And I'm going to give you three ways in which God is immutable. Number one, God is immutable in God's essence. The word immutable means God will not mutate. God will not change. God will not evolve into something else. God cannot grow because growth is a mutation. God cannot grow and God cannot diminish. God is, never was, he just is. And God's essence God will never be reduced. God is sovereign because he is God. The whole world can go to hell and God will still be God. Arthur Pink says it this way. He says God is often mentioned.
and it has hurricanes and it has tornadoes. But when it's all over, the rock is still standing there, unmovable. That is your God. He is stable in his essence. He cannot be reduced and he cannot be increased. He was perfect when he started, absolute in his majesty. He's immutable in his essence. Time will not change God because God is eternal. You will grow old, but God will not. Time will affect you, but time cannot touch God because God does not live in time. God created time. God lives in eternity and God stands above time. He is immutable in essence. He is unchanging. He will not be mutated by your circumstances. Somebody say amen up in here. Amen. Number two, God is immutable in his attributes. Whatever God can do, God can do. Whatever God was, he is and will be. His attributes remain the same. His power will not diminish over time. His attributes are consistent. If he was a healer, he is a healer. If he was a provider, he is a provider. If he was a, a way maker, he is a way maker. His attributes are still the same. If he could part the Red Sea, he can part the Red Sea. If he could raise the dead, he can raise the dead. If he could turn water into wine, he can turn water into wine. There is nothing that God can do that he now can't do. His attributes are immutable. They will not diminish. Your attributes will diminish. That's why we wear glasses. That's why we got these plastic teeth in our mouth. Because <laughs> what was isn't anymore. <laughs> That's why we got this piece in our hair. That's why we got to be putting protein on our scalp. Because you have a lot of things that were but are not. But whatever God was, he is and always will be. His attributes are immutable. Do you hear what I'm saying to you this morning? Number three, God is immutable in counsel. His counsel will not change. If he told you to come, then he told you to come. If he told you to preach, then he told you to preach. If he told you to shut up, then he told you to shut up. His counsel doesn't change, which means your purpose doesn't change. If God created you with something in mind, he will not then create you and change his mind. His counsel does not change. His method may change, but his counsel remains the same. God may reroute you, but if the redemption does not change, his counsel will not change. If he created you for a purpose, then the purpose remains the same. That's why Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. When he slayed me, he reviled me, but when it, it's all over, I will arrive where he created me to arrive. His counsel cannot be mutated. God is immutable. I want that to sink in. Because many of you have been created for a purpose, but you have gotten off track, but God has not. Your circumstances does not change God's purpose. God is absolute. Oh, only if Moses could have heard this message, I could have saved him 40 years of his life. When Moses started running away from the children of Israel, the Hebrew children, he ran because they rejected him. He loved them and they hurt him. And the bad thing about love is that you can't help who you love. Your love is not rational. And Moses is having this love affair with the children, with the Hebrew children, because his mother was Hebrew and his daddy was Hebrew, but his experience were Egyptian. And you always want what you didn't get. And Moses was related to people he wasn't connected to. He wasn't connected to the Egyptians. And now Moses needs to connect to who he was related to, and he was related to the Hebrews. And he's loving them and longing for them, and he goes to them, and they misunderstood him, and they rejected him. His dilemma is this. Once they rejected him, he couldn't go to them, and he couldn't go back to Egypt because he murdered an Egyptian, caught between a rock and a hard place. And he crosses through the desert and across the water to Midian. And he hides in Jethro's house amongst the Midianites for 40 years. He disappears. And he can't be found. Nobody knows where he is. AWOL. MIA. Absent without leave. Missing in action for 40 years. He was 
much like an Egyptian that the Midianites thought he was Egyptian. He walked like an Egyptian. He spoke the Egyptian language. He was educated in Egyptian schools. He passed himself off as if he was an Egyptian. And he dwelt among the Midianites for 40 years. He met a woman and married there. Her, he married the seventh daughter of Jethro, and her name was Zephora. She gave Moses two children, and Moses thought he had gotten away from God. Moses had been successful in the Midian, but success is irrelevant to purpose. Let me tell you something. If your success is not in line with God's purpose, then you can be successfully wrong. And for 40 years, Moses was successfully wrong. Even though he was doing his thing and he was the man, he was rejected from Hebrew and outlawed from Egypt, and he was alienated from heaven. But he's the man in Midian. Because we go where whoever claps for us the loudest, especially those who have been rejected. Rejected people always love acceptance, even if they have to compromise their destiny to get there. And all of a sudden, after 40 years, God appears in a burning bush. The burning bush is so spectacular to us that we preach the bush at the expense of the message. Oh yeah, we think the bush is the most important part of the story, but it's not. The bush was only there to get your attention. It is not the message. It is the vehicle that carries the message. Because when you really belong to God, God will set something on fire to get your attention. Keep in mind that the bush is mutable until the immutable God gets in the bush. And what got Moses' attention was the bush was not consumed. And the reason the bush was not consumed was because an immutable God was in the midst of a mutable bush. And now the bush is being regenerated. I know the word is regenerated, but I want to emphasize gene to show you that the genes were designed to be mutable until the immutable God got in the bush. And he regenerated the bush so it defied its own laws. You know the story. The bush said to Moses, I have seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and I have heard the groaning and I have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. We have unfinished business to do. Moses goes back to Egypt, empowered by God, and through the power of God, sets God's people free and leads them through the Red Sea, stops at Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, wanders around the desert for 40 years, which he is unable for 40 years and leads the, the, the people to the promised land which he is unable to enter and looks at the promised land from a distance on Mount Nebo and then dies. My brothers and sisters, this concludes my message. Let the blessed ones in Christ shout amen.